Chairman of the Homeowners Association meeting. Um, we can have a little quiet. Matt. What? Is, you're there? It's not going to run. We need to wipe her down. Quiet, Mr. Grant. Um, let me start with the uh, police. Our senior lead officer give us an update. And uh, apparently there are some changes afoot, so to speak, at the uh, Van Nuys Division. Please, please mention what's happening and give us some updates on the situation in Sherman Oaks. Thank you, Richard. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm, officer, I'm Officer Barry. I'm the Senior Lead Officer for Northern Sherman Oaks, along with my partner, Officer Saldana, and he covers the southern portion of Sherman Oaks. Uh, okay. uh, just briefly, we have some good news to report. Uh, currently, we're down about 12% in overall crime for the Sherman Oaks area as compared to this same time period for 2013. So the numbers are going down. Um, but with that being said, obviously there still is activity um, out and about. And what we wanted to pass on to all of you tonight is with the holidays uh, fast approaching, uh, just please take that extra precaution to secure your property. The number one thing right now that we're seeing is going to be vehicle break-ins and we're still seeing a lot of folks that are leaving uh, you know, handbags, wallets, laptop computers. So just be aware, um, especially when you're out visiting the local malls, um, when you're shopping and whatnot, there are criminals out there looking to steal. Um, also, um, for the month of November, it's our ATM Crime Prevention Awareness Month, so I'm going to leave some flyers over on the table over there. You guys can feel free to grab a flyer on the way out. Thank you. What's happening in VNI's division? Well, we're going to have some changes. We have uh, one of our captains, uh, Captain Ivan Minsel, is retiring. He'll probably be leaving us by January. And we're going to have a new captain coming in to Van Nuys Division taking over. And when that happens, we'll invite him to come on down. We should speak to you guys. Thank you. And uh, will, will we see the both of you at the toy drive? And are you going to bring some equipment? Uh, some the, the ram, the things that does the ramming of the house. Oh, you don't use that anymore. No, no. no. not Sherman Oaks at least. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Bob Anderson, come on up and give us a couple updates on helicopters and the 405. Hi everybody, I'm Bob Anderson. Um, I have a separate group that I'm president of called the Los Angeles Area Helicopter Noise Coalition. And we're just starting negotiations with the helicopter pilots to try to get some measures in place to quiet it down around LA. So wish us luck. Um, the FAA just finished, uh, they're in the process of spending $250,000 to install a helicopter noise complaint system in Los Angeles County. So if you live anywhere in the county and you're bothered by helicopter noise, you're going to be able to call the number, tell them where you live, log a complaint, or you can go on the web and do it. I don't have the details yet, but everything will be in the newsletter when we do find out. And if you are bothered, we ask that you please complain. Uh, 405 is just about finished in Sherman Oaks. Hopefully. I, I live near the Valley Vista on-ramp and they haven't closed it for about a week now so I consider that finished but you know, they'll probably close it tomorrow. But uh, they're still working on Skirball and some of the other things and it's backing a lot of traffic. I got an email from a man this morning who said, what's going on? Everything's backed up. Hopefully they'll finish everything soon. Hopefully it'll get better when they finish. We just don't know. By moving the Skirball ramps a half mile further south, we think they changed a lot of the traffic patterns in Sherman Oaks. And we won't know until a couple of months after it's all done and we can keep our fingers crossed. So I'll keep you posted. Thank you. How will it affect Sherman Oaks, positively or negatively? Negatively, why? Because of It'll probably be negative on Sherman Oaks because it makes it harder for people to go up the back way on Havenhurst and swing up on Mulholland. So more of them will try to go up the 405 or try to go up things like Woodcliffe Road and Beverly Glen. 
so it can back up more into the neighborhood. But we really won't know until it's done. Can I answer your question? Yeah, what, one question. Are, are, are you aware of that proposed uh, signal light at uh, Sherman Oaks and Valley Vista and Beverly Glen? Are you aware of that conversation that's going around? I, I'm not. I, the question was, was I aware of the proposed traffic light at Valley Vista and Beverly Glen? And I'm assuming you mean a second light for the second part of Valley Vista. That's correct. We have got at Valley Vista there. This is a lot of traffic up in Stansbury. I'm not surprised because I've looked at that and wondered why they hadn't. But I'll look into it. Uh, if, if they ever put a light in there, it would be the worst thing ever. Thanks. Okay. For those of us who are slow, where Bob, where are we talking? Valley Vista. That's the second Valley Vista. Oh, the, on the, on the, on the uh, south. east. South. Okay. South. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Bob, you're going to show us the next slide. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, if we can have uh, can any candidates in the room, uh, please come up. Also, any deputies to introduce themselves. Why don't we do candidates first? And uh, as you know from the flyer on your table, we are going to have a debate in, at our January meeting of the candidates for city council. The election is uh, March 3rd is the primary. We are getting a new city council member for Sherman Oaks since Tom LeVon is not eligible to run again. And uh, so we'll have the primary on March 3rd. Two people. Uh, we'll then go on to the general election, which is the first part of June, correct? May. First, that's what I said, first part of May. And the new person takes over in, uh, on July 1. Okay, so candidates. Thank you so much. My name is Teddy Davis. I grew up going to school right here in Sherman Oaks. It would be an honor to represent each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Joan Pelago and I'm running for Council District 4 and I want to thank all of you for signing our petition to get on the ballot. It doesn't mean you're supporting us but you're giving us the opportunity to get on the ballot. I want to thank you. I look forward to seeing you at the So Hot Toy Drive Sunday, December 8th. 7th, and then I look forward to seeing you at the debate that we're going to have that so is so us having for the candidates on January 21st. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Tamar, you're running for election to city council? No. Yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Tamar Gallatson. Um, I'm your neighborhood prosecutor, but I'm also a member of the Los Angeles School Board and I represent about half the San Fernando Valley, including all of Sherman Oaks. Um, and I am <laughs> running for re-election. We are on the same ballot in March. Um, so thank you for all of you who signed my petition today. Um, and I'm looking forward to serving you again on the school board and remaining your neighborhood prosecutor. Pardon me. Uh, how long have you been serving us uh, on the school board? I've been on the school board. I've been on the school board for seven years, and I've been your neighborhood prosecutor for twelve. Are you a mother? Show us your children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, my ten-year-old is here somewhere. Wave, and he goes to Riverside Drive Elementary School here in Sherman Oaks. And his older brother um, stayed home to work on homework. So um, yeah. I, I'm the only mom on the school board. I'm the only person who has kids in the public school. And uh, well, one final question with your school board. When, when do you think there will be a new permanent uh, superintendent? What's your speculation on a new permanent superintendent? Probably a year. Um, we, we have not started the search yet. Um, and I think it's going to actually be pretty difficult to find um, candidates of the caliber that we're looking. So my guess is um, hopefully by the beginning of the next school year. So, Cortinas is how old? Very youthful, 80-something. 80-something. Not, not that there's anything wrong with 80s. Uh, but isn't it a tiring job? He probably gets in about 10 o'clock in the morning and goes home around 3? 11. Have any 
of you met Ray Cortinas? I know many of you have. He's like the Energizer Bunny. Um, he gets in work at the crack of dawn, and he's still there late at night. He's we we kind of forced him to slow down a little, um, but. Um, one of the most amazing people, so much energy, he's so smart and wonderful to work with, and hopefully he'll be able to guide us through this really rough time right now, and we have a lot of faith in him. He's spoken here before as a result of your efforts, and maybe uh, next year we'll have him again. I'll try. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Masha Long, updates on development issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, Suncast project is where it was uh, last meeting, 298 units, uh, plus a, a market. We're working with the council office and um, uh, Renee Weitzer, who um, has agreed with our uh, goals, which are to try to reduce the overall height by stepping the buildings down, uh, reduce the number of units. They need more loading space for trucks because there's only two loading docks for the for the markets and the, and the stores, and the trucks have to back in uh, from Hazel Team. Uh, there are, likewise, there are no parking for any moving vans for any of these uh, 298 units, so they have to park on the side streets. Um, we'd like to see a greater greater setbacks from the street, and um, so we have a long wish list. And uh, uh, I, the rumor has it that uh, the councilman position is uh, moving towards ours, so that's that's good news. And if someone wants to get involved in the Sunkist project, what should they do? <laughs> Uh, they can uh, contact me <coughs> or Kimberly Gersten, who's the chair of the, uh, of, the, of, the of the project. Is Kimberly here? Yes, she is. Oh, stand up, Kimberly. She may have snuck out, but uh, okay, go stand up. <laughs> uh, she's just recovering from eye surgery, so it's kind of tough. She might have walked into a closet. <laughs> So we should be back by next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John Eisen. Every year I come up here at the November meeting and say the same thing. Do you remember what I say? I say next year. <laughs> The Board of Directors, we have uh, elections for the Board of Directors every year. And if anyone is interested in this position, see me. Thank you. Okay, wait, wait. You need to entice them by telling them the benefits. I don't know of any. <laughs> the benefits are you get to be involved in your community and you get to have influence on what occurs in Sherman Oaks. Okay, wait a minute. You're not telling them about the annual dinner we have in January. We don't need to about, talk about that. How about the pay? The well, pay, first of all, in the dinner, who pays for the dinner? We, we all pay for the dinner ourselves out of our pocket, and we get no pay for anything we do. And most people don't even get reimbursement for any out-of-pocket expenses. No, I haven't gotten any reimbursement for 20 years. I haven't either. <laughs> That's right. So you can, and neither have I. That's right. All these people. They, so don't they, they all come after me after the meeting. Don't all come at once, please. IBT. She wants to know what's happening on Sepulveda. Yeah. Yeah. She wants to know about the project that was approved. Why do you get paid so much uh, if you don't get a full report? Uh, the IBT project on Sepulveda, just south of the 101 freeway, this massive project, violation of the very of the specific plans uh, that uh, Councilman Lavange gave a green light to, in spite of all of the variances. What is the status? This is how I get my exercise by walking up here. Uh, the current status is that it's in litigation. 
Um, and there is a, um, uh, a law firm that's doing the litigation. They're supported by um, an, an anonymous donor. Um, and um, so uh, we'll see. I mean, uh, 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 that, that's, that's all I know. You know what I know. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you. Uh, I had asked for any deputies who identified themselves, but then I did see uh, Here comes. Steve. Here comes. There's one deputy left. In the <laughs> 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 How many deputies have left in your office? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did you take it? Um, Hi everyone, my name is Eric King. I am uh, Councilman, Councilman LaVange's deputy for Sherman Oaks. Um, hope everyone is doing well. I uh, just wanted to let you know on a few things. I wanted to piggyback on what Bob was talking about, the traffic. Um, you know, we're, we're working with LADOT and LAPD about the traffic uh, that has uh, inundated our hillside communities. Um, we are working on that. Uh, I want to ask everyone to, uh, you know, drive carefully. If you walk in those communities, uh, be careful because, it, you know, they are public roads. So as of right now, people are allowed to access them. You know, but we are working to limit the access possibly and, you know, working with LATOT and LAPD. Um, so I ask to be careful walking because we've had a lot of issues with speeding through the cell sites, commuters going to work. And um, once again, we have a beautification truck that's in Sherman Oaks at least once a week. If you have any uh, requests, any boat yards that get left out places, um, anything that a beautification truck can do, you might think, give me a call and I can send them out. So, uh, yeah. Okay, Jules, I have a question. Uh, has Councilman LaBonge RSVP for the toy drive? No. no. Wait a minute. Neither has anybody. Heard that. <laughs> okay, I mean, I know he's coming. But you may want to confirm. Uh, I'll confirm that. Make sure he has it on his calendar. Tell him we'll have a microphone there. Yes, we're going to have a microphone for him. Then he'll yeah, probably want to talk about it. Exactly. <laughs> Steve? Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Stephen Butcher. I work for Assemblymember Adrin Nazarian. Uh, that's Assemblymember Nazarian. We represent the 46th Assembly District, which includes all of Sherman Oaks. Uh, so we are your state representative. You can call me with any state issues you might have. Uh, that's unfortunately not too often, but uh, Caltrans, you know, it's a big issue. Uh, EDD, Department of Insurance, uh, any DMV, any state issues like that, I can always help out. Uh, and uh, I'm always here. I come usually uh, as often as I can. Uh, I will not be here for a month or so, um, but uh, I'll be back in February. Will we see you at the toy drive? Uh, uh, unless my wife is giving birth, you will. That's right. <laughs> what about Adrian? <coughs> the assembly member, uh, I have requested for his time to be there, absolutely. I'm going to try to get him there. He lives for you, Jules. He lives just a few blocks away. He does. He does. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, some of the board of directors. If you have any problems, please see them after the meeting. Jay Weitzler, please stand up. No, 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 you have a broken leg. Sit down. Okay, uh, self-introductions. Jules, you have to introduce yourself. Self-introduction. Jules Spear. Okay, Bob. Self. Chuck, Matt, <laughs> anyone else that I miss? Max, how about you? And, and Matt, he doesn't want to own up to Chuck. Yes. I introduced Chuck. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else before. We've already know there's no December meeting, no December newsletter. We know there's a city council debate at January meeting, third Wednesday. So I'd like to uh, introduce our uh, main speaker. I did see him come in, did I? There he is. No stranger uh, to the organization. How many years have you been coming here as a non-elected official? Well, probably about six, seven years, maybe. At least six or seven years. And I've asked him a couple things before he, he discusses the meat and potatoes of what he wants to discuss. Who is Ron Gelfrey? Where did you grow up? You know, uh, tell us a little about yourself. Who is this Ron guy? And number two, how did you defeat Councilman Dennis Sign, a very popular councilman with a lot of money, and who were you to think you could beat him? So maybe give us some insight, because there are candidates in the room here who want to know how you did it. So. 
But you can use this one later. Smile, oh, that's why you want There we go. Uh -huh. Okay, I think this is taped down. One moment. Hold the tape off. It's your mic. It's your meeting. You're the controller. Take control of okay. that mic. Now it works. All right. Good evening, everybody. Great to be here. Thank you so much. So who the heck am I? Okay, that was the first question, I guess. Um, well, I, I will begin by saying I think I'm the luckiest guy I know. Because I get to do a job that I love, absolutely, uh, that of being controller of the city of LA. And uh, I began this odyssey a number of years ago when I got absolutely obsessed with the finances of the city of Los Angeles. And actually, it, it started many years ago when I got a, uh, a letter from the then council member of uh, my district, which explained why, it was a letter to everybody in the neighborhood explaining why our uh, streets were not going to get repaved anytime soon. And it was a really very nicely written letter, uh, but basically the message was that we'd be waiting up to about 30 years. And I thought to myself, how did we get to this point uh, in a city like Los Angeles where we didn't have the money to do some of these real basic things? What was going wrong? And everybody, of course, wants to see all these services, but it became clear to me that you don't get those unless you straight out, straighten out the finances of the city. So that's sort of what started me out on, on this odyssey of, of, uh, of getting obsessed with the finances of the city. Um, then what happened was that I, I was involved in my neighborhood council, I became a budget advocate, uh, and then at one point I was asked by uh, the then council president, now Mayor Garcetti, if I wanted to be on the city's ethics commission. And I had a lot of what my grandmother would call chutzpah. And I said, well, that would be really nice, but I'd like you to create a brand new commission. I want you to make me its chair. And uh, that was to look at uncollected uh, receivables in the city of Los Angeles. And the city was doing a really bad job of, of uh, collecting those receivables. And again, one thing sort of led to another. And then I found myself running for uh, controller when uh, Wendy Gruel announced that she was uh, running for mayor. And uh, I think sometimes a little bit of willful ignorance maybe is a good thing, because uh, I had no idea just how crazy complicated and involved it was to run for a citywide office, and maybe that is the best thing that I had going for me. Uh, I just really believed that it was doable, and I was really passionate about what I was doing, uh, and I really enjoyed running. I didn't enjoy the fundraising part. That part I didn't really enjoy. But the rest, to meet people and to go around the city, it's an amazing sort of privilege. And uh, and so here I am. I've actually been living in LA for 30 years, uh, originally from Philadelphia, lived in St. Louis a little while, first in my family to be born in the United States. Uh, my father's uh, originally from Romania, Holocaust survivor, my mother from Israel, they were both in the Israeli army, uh, both very tough cookies and thankfully still around. And uh, when I first came to LA, I was a journalist, and uh, also uh, then uh, went to law school, practiced law for quite a number of years, and uh, got really interested in municipal finance. So I hope that answers the question. Now, how did you beat Dennis? By yeah, working well, well, really hard. <laughs> Money. You're... Actually, I'm pleased to say, one of the nice things was I, I, I actually, usually the ones with the most money, in about 95% of the cases win in almost every race. Uh, this is one race where um, money did not do it. And uh, I, I actually had substantially less money and still won. So uh, it's, money is not everything, thankfully. Uh, so what I, what I thought I would share with you this evening is um, a little bit about uh, what we call our control panel. Because as, um, uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that I was really interested in is where our money comes from and where it goes. And I found it really just as a, as a citizen of the city, uh, really frustrating in not being able to know where it was all coming from and where it was all going. So when I took office, one of the first things that I wanted to do was to open up the doors, the windows of the finances of the city and make them available for everybody to see. And what you have is Control Panel, which if you go to uh, controlpanel.la, uh, you can have a lot of information about the finances of the city that never have been available. 
And there were other cities that were starting to do this about a year and a half ago and even two years ago. Uh, and the city of LA was completely behind. Uh, we really had none of this data available at all. And within a very short period of time, uh, we have amazingly not only caught up, but we are actually exceeding what many other cities are doing in terms of making data available. And uh, so much so that actually uh, we just won uh, an award from, uh, from a, an organization of, of governance that uh, looked at the site and what it is that we put out there and sees this as an example of what other cities and other jurisdictions, counties, states ought to be doing. So I'll um, walk you through this a little bit. And uh, then we can also talk a little bit about DWP, and then I'd be happy to stick around uh, for all sorts of different questions. I will begin by introducing uh, Kyle Hall, who's one of our, our data geeks in our office. Um, it's, it's not an official title, but I think it should become an official title in our, in our office. Uh, and I also have Chris Benedetto of our office, as well as Lowell Goodman, who's here. Um, I would not be able to do many of the things that we do, I would not be able to do any of the things that we do without some of the most amazing people who have come and been, become part of our office. So, in open data, what you'll see here, uh, at the very top, by the way, is a little bit of information about something called the Civic Innovation Lab. And what became really clear to me very early on was that we have a lot of great people in the controller's office, and as many of you know, we're in charge of doing payroll for more than 40,000 people. We do the financial statements for the city. Pretty much every payment that the city makes has my name on it. Uh, and we also have a waste fraud and abuse unit, and of course we do audits, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but uh, there's a lot of great civil service staff, but also a lot of people who've been there for many, many years and a lot of old technology. So we created the Civic Innovation Lab with a number of outside partners. Uh, and we, we have a partnership with this, with this place called The Hub, which is really kind of interesting. It's full of all these 20-somethings that uh, all bring their laptops and work uh, in, uh, in this industrial part of downtown. And they're taking our data and doing all sorts of really interesting and creative things with it. So I, I can talk more about that. And there's also in interesting info here about what we buy, and I'll get into that in a moment, uh, in terms of the details of everything that the city purchases. So if you look here, if you go to the website, you'll find you know, some basic information about the audits and reports that we do. So if we click on that, um, and hopefully everybody can see, uh, one of the featured data sets we have here, uh, we, we have a, a map, for example, of all of the streets in the city of LA and what the grade is for your particular street. I regret to say mine uh, is an F-rated street. Uh, but you can, you can search, and, and this also draws information from the Bureau of Street Services. Uh, our audit was very much about what are the opportunities to collect more money in order to see that our streets are put into better shape, uh, as well as how to prevent further degradation of our streets. A lot of that, by the way, has to do with the ever so sexy subject of the SDRF, which is the Street Damage Restoration Fee which is supposed to be paid by utility companies, including cable companies, when they cut up the street. Uh, I think we all have seen our streets sometimes repaved or slurried, and then two weeks later somebody makes a cut into it. This drives me crazy. And uh, we have recommendations of how you can upgrade your technology to avoid that happening, but when it does happen, to also collect the money that is due to the city for the damages that are done. Um, we also have information about the special funds of the city. Now everybody has heard about the general fund, of course, but we've actually got about 970 so-called special funds of the city. And these are funds for uh, all sorts of specific purposes and often from very specific sources of revenue. Surprisingly, the accounting for all of these was really quite poor. Um, we've now put this information up there for everybody to see. Uh, many columns, about 40 columns of data of how much money is in there, what are the cash balances, what are the committed amounts, what are the amounts that have been paid in and out of each of these funds. Why is it so important? Because, interestingly enough, there's about $8 billion at any given moment in the treasury of the city. That's besides the pension funds. Of that $8 billion, about 90% of it almost is made up of these special funds. And to not have had this information up there, for everybody to see, and by the way, a lot of these are so-called off-budget as well. So to not have had this information, I think, was really a, a tremendous disservice to everybody, including, by the way, the decision-makers at City Hall. 
So now it's all there, and by the way, you can search each and every one of these special funds. You can search uh, by dollar amount, you can search by department, you can search by use, you can do a word search. Um, for example, let's say you're interested in parks or you're interested in streets. Whatever that subject might be and what kind of revenue sources might be available, you can actually do a uh, search for that and begin to see some of the revenue sources that might be available to help in a particular community. And if you go all the way to the end of this, by the way, what we also included was the name and the contact information, phone and email of the person who manages each and every single one of these 900 plus funds. So you actually have an uh, actual human being that you can talk to to get some information about these. Um, so let's go back for a moment here. And um, here are uh, the audits that have been done by my office recently, as well as previously, and a whole bunch of different ways to do those searches. And I'll talk a little bit more about our audits in just a moment, but let's go back to the, to the main page. And now there's payroll, which is over here. And what we put up is the tremendous detail uh, of payroll for everybody in the city of Los Angeles. And you can search by department, you can search by position, and when you click on this, you can, be, you can see certainly the top earners, which everybody loves to, to look at, uh, and, and which uh, uh, now includes information on the base pay, temporary bonus pay, longevity bonus pay, permanent bonus pay, overtime, lump sum payments, other payments and adjustments. And by the way, for each and every position, you can now find out what is approximately the amount that we're putting in for uh, pensions, for health care, for dental, uh, and uh, you can also see all of the details for each and every single one of these positions and search in a variety of ways. Um, you'll notice, by the way, that the port pilots as a whole are some of the best paid people in the city of LA. They're the ones who bring in the ships uh, at the port. But you can also see some of those who have gotten some very large other pay and adjustments and that you can go into greater and greater detail the more that you kind of click through on each and every one of these things. You'll notice, by the way, a bunch of different uh, little boxes of different colors here that allow you to filter this. You can download it, you can put it into an Excel, you can tweet it, you can Facebook it, you can take this data, compare it against other data, and you can also create your own data sets. Now, not everybody is, is a super wonk and wants to do that, but there are a number of people who are very engaged in what's happening in the city who have sort of created their own uh, sign-in and login you can save your searches, share them with other people, and then there's information that tells you about each and every one of the searches, that you see who, how many people have done each and every one of the different types of searches. So you can see what's the most popular kind of data and what's most interesting to people. So let's go back again for a moment here. And again, payroll by department, payroll by position. Um, you can kind of go in there, and, and the best way to kind of understand this is to actually experience it and spend some time with it. And let's go back now again. Um, but just, just one other thing on payroll, this also allows you to compare different kinds of positions. For example, you can type in a tree surgeon, and you can see everybody who's a tree surgeon, everybody who's a tree surgeon uh, a supervisor. You can see what the tree surgeon uh, for Department X gets versus the tree surgeon at DWP. It goes down to that level of detail. Um, so when we go back, uh, let's, oh, you, you put in tree surgeon. Thank you, okay, that was real quick. See, it's, it's almost instant that you can see, uh, by the way, the pay grades and, and all of the various bonuses that are paid for each and every position in the city. And literally, depending upon how quick your internet is, it's at your fingertips in a matter of seconds. Interestingly, this was not at the fingertips of even the management of the city. They would have to ask for report backs, and it would take weeks sometimes to get this. It's now there for everybody, and it's quick. Purchasing, this is actually one of the newest things that we just added. And um, we have a number of featured data sets, but what we wanted to do was to put out all of the items that the city purchases, down to the granular level. So you can see every roll of toilet paper that the city buys, what our per unit cost is, who we're buying it from, what department it's going to. It's, it's almost unprecedented because this has never been available before. Now, does all this data necessarily change the operation of the city overnight? Not overnight, but it has an impact in a variety of different ways. First of all, everybody who's making decisions in the city, when they know that this is there for everybody to see, 24 hours a day, 
it begins to change the behavior of the decision makers in the departments and of the elected officials. What it also does, and, and you'll see more about procurement in a second, I'm really trying to drive an agenda of procurement reform because we have to really, in many ways, reform how we do our purchasing in the city, both our technology as well as our processes. By the way, the city pays sales tax on pretty much everything it buys, just like you and I do. Much of that sales tax is being paid to other jurisdictions, not within the city. And that means that others get to repave a few more streets or hire a few more police officers. Uh, that's good news for them, but not particularly great news for us. And this is about sort of driving an agenda of trying to see that change. So we have here information of who are our top city vendors, and there are details about this. And then there's also neighborhood council expenditures. You can now go online and see every neighborhood council and all of their expenditures. You can search by the council, you can search by the vendor, by the type of expenditure, you can do a word search, you name it. So let's go to LA Procurement for a moment here. And um, what you will find is that the city buys just about everything. You name it, if you can possibly imagine it, or even if you didn't want to imagine it, the city buys it. Um, we, we, I, I made some very interesting discoveries of some of the more unique purchases the city makes. Uh, for example, our purchases of frozen rats, uh, which we buy actually for the zoo. And uh, we buy all sorts of different types of frozen rats, go figure, in small, medium, large, uh, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. We buy mice as well, and these are, these are used actually to, uh, to feed uh, animals at the zoo. Um, I even discovered, by the way, the uh, cocaine and heroin purchases of the city, which actually, there's not a lot of things that come as a huge surprise to me. That came as quite a surprise. Um, it's purchased uh, to actually uh, calibrate uh, LAPD testing equipment for uh, drugs. It's purchased by, uh, it's purchased by, uh, or rather from FDA approved vendors and uh, in its purest form. Although I think what annoyed me a little bit was the vendor that we bought it from was in Texas as if we couldn't find a local source. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so you can see here uh, the details of each and every single one of these purchases, who we bought it from, um, uh, the testing kits, uh, all of the tremendous details of the dates, what the check amount was, uh, what the quantities were, etc. Uh, and you can begin to kind of uh, navigate and experiment with this and, and it's amazing to see what it is that the uh, city buys and you can type in, for example, uniforms, see all the uniforms the city buys, what we pay per unit. Um, you can see what it is that we pay for, uh, for LAPD uh, boots. Uh, how many basketball hoops we bought, um, and what we paid. They're actually, let's go to the cards for a moment, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of this. We created actually some cards to give some of these uh, a little bit of uh, context. So uh, actually the, the single largest item that we bought in the city uh, over the last year was $12.3 million for one Augusta Westland AW139 twin turbine helicopter, actually used by fire department. Um, but you can see here what we paid for uh, custom boots for patrol officers, what we paid for radar signs, 2,723 basketball nets that we bought for our parks and what we paid for them, the number of soccer balls we bought, cost of ballots. Um, these are the printing costs for ballots, 629,218. Uh, our fire hoses, um, the lust tax, which you see over here, uh, and actually, uh, interestingly enough, if you click on this, uh, you can see the details of what this is. Ah, welcome to Notre Dame High School, okay. Interesting. What happened to our internet? Uh, so if you, you click on this, it's actually the Federal Leaking Underground Storage Trust Fund, or LUST for short. Uh, everybody who buys uh, gasoline uh, pays a little a uh, tiny bit of lust tax, little did you know. Uh, but uh, the city buys a lot of gas, and so this was the total of what we paid for the lust tax uh, over the course of the uh, last year. Uh, and then if you uh, keep on going here, you can see, we even have the details on the number of mops that we bought. Um, we bought uh, 30,685 wet mops, 
we have a lot of facilities, we've got a lot of mopping going on in the city. Um, but by the way, these are just the wet mops. They're also dry mops, and there are other types of mops that we buy. And we buy rags. Rags cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. It's, it's unbelievable. But you begin to kind of understand the complexity that is the city of LA. Um, and then here are everybody's favorite, which are the large frozen rats. Again, not to be confused with the medium or the small-sized ones. Uh, so, let's go back to, to look at some of these, uh, to back to the, uh, the center page. And back one more. Here is revenue information. We now have information on all the revenues of the city, and what we also have provided is uh, information on what was budgeted for each type of revenue class, and then actually looking at what was actually achieved. So it's a tool now to hold people responsible and say, okay, well, you exceeded the amount of revenue that was supposed to be uh, uh, achieved, or perhaps you fell short, what were the reasons? And you can look at each and every source of revenue. So if you click on this, by the way, um, you can see exactly uh, how much revenue we have from fees, fines, and penalties. Everything from dog licenses to the controller's fee, which, by the way, I'll be collecting before you leave. Um, in, in fact, actually, the controller's fee is, is charged for certain kinds of, of uh, checks that we uh, issue. Uh, but you can see the, the large amounts for the solid waste fee, the parking fines, and then everything else, all these other hundreds, in fact, of fees, but they add up when all is said and done to small little slivers of, of what is collected in, in fees, fines, and, and penalties. Let's go back again. And uh, you can also check for revenues by department. Uh, we'll go back to the main page again. I'm kind of going through this real quickly, but I want to just give you a flavor of all of the information that's out there for everybody to see. And again, none of this was there for people to see, really, certainly not in this form before. We now have a virtual checkbook of the city of LA. And uh, uh, basically, that means that all these checks that we issue, and there, some of them are checks, some of them are electronic payments, uh, but there is now a way for you to search by department, by vendor, by expenditure type, and to actually see each and every single individual payment along what the payment reference was. So let's say we search by department here for a moment, and um, we click on that, and then who am I to kind of preach to everybody else about getting efficient if I don't do some of the same? So we can click on controller, for example, and you can see uh, the uh, the expenditures that are in here one by one, but let's search for the last fiscal year. And there's a drop down menu over here where you can search for different time periods. So we're going to search for the, uh, for the most recent uh, time period. And then you'll see exactly how many, uh, how many transactions and how many expenditures there were. This is aside from payroll, because payroll is the largest part of of our expenditures, as it is for almost every department. On average, it's 85 plus percent of, of the city's uh, expenditures is related to, to human capital, to personnel. Um, so you can see here what it is that we spent, for example, uh, for American shredding, which actually I want to increase my shredding expenses because I want to have less paper. I want to do much more electronically. So I'm hoping to actually see more shredding happen over the course of the next year or two. Um, you can see uh, other types of expenditures, uh, all of our consultants. You can see what was paid to American Express. You can also click on, for example, there was uh, AT&T, which, uh, which we clicked on. Uh, there previously were some cell phones that the uh, uh, controller's office had, and uh, we've now gotten rid of those. But that got me interested to see, and you can type in, for example, AT&T and see everything that is paid to AT&T. just actually do a word search for that, or actually it comes up right over here. So this was one particular payment. This is an actual payment that was made, for example, on January the 17th of 2012, $80.33 to AT&T. Now, you'll notice that it says pay to the order of AT&T. So now let's click on that. And what you'll be able to do is now see every payment that the city made to AT&T and how much it came to. So. Since actually the data that has been put into this, since July of 2011, we have made $17 million of payments to AT&T. Needless to say, we have a lot of phones, we have a lot of data lines, um, we have a lot of technology, 
Um, this, of course, doesn't tell you did we get the best value for the $17 million that we paid to AT&T. Sure the but friends and family program. Friends, we, we need to be part of the friends and family program, I think. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but it is sort of the beginning of better understanding where it is that our money is going, because this is really the first step uh, in order to analyze whether it's being spent wisely or not. But then this got me interested in, and by the way, you can see which departments and when those payments were made, etc. So then I thought, okay, this is how much we paid to AT&T. Well, how much should we pay to AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile and Sprint? So you can just simply type those words in, um, and singular, which we added as well. And you will see here, $46.7 million. Um, this was since 2011. If you want to narrow this and look at it just for the most recent uh, uh, fiscal year, then you can just type that in. And what you will see is every single payment that was made just in the most recent fiscal year, which was $8.618,120.46. And then you can drill down and look at each and every one of these uh, in invoice information. We're trying to add more, by the way, because we're not at the point where every single invoice is scanned, but the next step is going to be where there will be an invoice that is attached to each and every single one of these. So now you'll be able to really dig deep into all of this. Now, I'd be lying if I said that we in the controller's office have enough resources to analyze each and every single one of these payments that the city makes. Regrettably, we simply don't. But by putting this out for the public to see, there are plenty of people who are really interested in this. And by the way, if, if you let's say you're AT&T and you want to get some of Singular's business, you can bet that AT&T is looking at the bills that we have with Singular and with T-Mobile and with Sprint to see whether we're getting the best deal so that they can come to us and say, ah, you should give more of the business to AT&T. By the way, T-Mobile doing the same thing. And this is how we can spur some competition and spur some much better pricing for the city of LA. Um, let's go back for a moment here. And I'll, I'll try and wrap this part of it up in another two minutes or so, and then, and then we can kind of uh, uh, open it up for some questions. Um, uh, there's li liabilities and assets, so a lot of the information that we provide in the uh, financial statements has now been sort of digitalized and is available. Uh, we're also going to be doing, our next step is to do virtual mapping of a lot of the, li a lot of the assets of the city, the physical assets, certainly. Um, also, we've got a variety of different kind of statistics. We've got, uh, let's look at statistics and feature data for just a second. Uh, so you can see information that we, we put together. We did a, a small study of uh, women at work in the city of LA and what they're paid. Uh, we looked at various demographics. Uh, we have a whole series of operating indicators. Um, we call them operating indicators and not metrics per se because metrics are really about sort of measuring performance. Operating indicators give you information but don't necessarily tell you about performance necessarily. And one of the tricks is trying to figure out how you find the right metrics for the city. So that's the next step. Okay. So we don't even have time for questions. Okay, great. And, uh, but before we hit the questions, a lot of people have asked me today, what, what the heck are you doing about getting the $40 million audit done? Ah, very good question. So this is about uh, two trusts which uh, were created uh, more than 10 years ago that are uh, joint trusts of management and uh, of the DWP and of IBW, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, that represents the vast majority of, of DWP workers. And uh, these were two trusts. One is called the Joint Safety Institute. One is called the Joint Training Institute. Uh, they were created for arguably a, a good purpose. We want to see more training. We want to see more safety. It's in everybody's best interest. Uh, but uh, what I wanted was just simply to understand how that money is being spent, because it is right here money, we're paying it, so we should understand how it's being paid, or rather how it's being spent. Uh, I asked for that information, I asked for it again, I asked for it a little bit more emphatically, it wasn't forthcoming. And Why uh, were they trying to hide that information from you? Ah, uh, that's a very good question that hopefully we'll find a better answer to once we actually uh, uh, get in there and conduct our audit, which we're about to start doing. Finally, after a year of them fighting us uh, in court, they signed an agreement 
which gives us uh, access to go and look at whatever there is in terms of financial evidence. <laughs> the next question that we keep getting asked here, <clears throat> here is, it's one thing to do audits. Yep. And, but how, how does it result in savings? Is, uh, are these audits just put in a drawer somewhere? Good question. Um, I, I will concede to you I have a somewhat different approach to doing audits uh, on a variety of different levels. First of all, uh, one of the necessary components that we put into every audit that we do now is benchmarking and looking at best practices, leading practices, next practices, both in other jurisdictions as well as in the private sector. And also comparing ourselves to other jurisdictions that uh, may be doing the very same thing so that we can look at how we're performing. That's number one. Number two is actually building a, uh, uh, a constituency and also building a support for a variety of recommendations that we want to put forward. So rather than just kind of say, okay, here's the audit, it's done, here are the recommendations, uh, actually working with a variety of different stakeholders, be it the department, uh, be it uh, members of council, uh, be it other uh, outside organizations, uh, to really kind of get everybody on the same page about what needs to be done. So who's the number one person helping you get this, getting this done, getting changes? Name names. Name names. The number one helper. Well, actually, uh, I, I will say a couple things. First of all, I think we're in, in an interesting and unique time in the city right now in that this is probably the first time in maybe decades where the three citywide officers, myself, the mayor, uh, city attorney, actually get along. We actually like each other. Um, it's a far cry from the days when there was ongoing lawsuits between uh, city attorney and controller. Um, so we have a job to be independent and we will not always agree on everything, uh, but it does help to actually have a collaborative relationship. That's, and by the way, the success that we've had, for example, uh, in, in the lawsuits that were brought and that were lost by uh, IBW uh, is, is thanks to the city attorney who worked very closely with us and dedicated a great deal of resources to helping us out. Um, Name names. I'm naming names. You know who the city attorney is, like you're. Uh, what about the Paul Kokorian, head of the budget committee? Well, actually, um, I'll give you a couple of, of more examples. Um, I mentioned the, uh, the uh, audit that uh, we just came out uh, on street services. Um, I'm really